As long as you can second. see my uh, presentation here. <laughs> yeah, about me. Got it. All right. And All right. we're uh, recording as well. Okay. So, like, um, we can do questions at the end. I'm, I'm open to doing questions, like, uh, as we move, move along also. I don't know if, what you prefer, Dave. If, um, it, it's really up to you, you know. It's, it's, if you get to a breaking point and you want to stop and ask for questions. But it's okay. up to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't mind if somebody has questions. I guess they can just jump in and stop me. Just yeah. unmute yourself, um, and then of course at the end, I guess we can do do questions. Um, so yeah, so clean architecture: the good, the bad, the ugly. It's a quick, quick bait title, I guess, of sorts. <laughs> um, so quickly about myself: I'm James Hickey. Um, it's not up here, but I'm a Microsoft MVP. Um, for a few months now. And so I've written a book, re uh, Refactoring TypeScript. If you're interested, you can get that on Pact or LeanPub. LeanPub is usually cheaper because um, you can pay what you want. Um, and I have an open source project for .NET called Coravel. If, if you're not familiar with that, you can just kind of Google that, I guess. And I also have a podcast with Derek Colmartin. Um, he's uh, pretty well known in the .NET community. And so we do the Loosely Coupled show, and that's uh, us basically just talking about software design and, and kind of just lots of different topics. We literally kind of go into each episode with like two sentences of, of uh, what we're going to talk about, and it, it's kind of all on the fly. So that's really fun. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll get right into this. So kind of the... Uh, the backdrop, I guess, or the background for this whole presentation is um, we'll we'll be talking a lot about kind of like the theoretical kinds of things, I guess. Um, definitely some of the practical stuff. But as far as uh, like my experience with clean architecture in particular, um, um, in my I guess my opinions on clean architecture. I've developed through actual experience, um, trying to use it with a new team and kind of running running into obstacles and trying to figure out what works, and what doesn't work. And so that it's kind of like a period of about two or three years worth of um, trying different things, I guess. So yeah, basically there was a new team for this company and um, one of the issues they had is lots of legacy. I'm sure. I'm sure everybody kind of knows what that's like, where you have maybe new features you want to add to your product, and it's just it, it's horrendous trying to add new features, which should take you like a few days, take you like weeks or months to implement them, to try to kind of shoehorn them, shoehorn them back into uh, what exists. And so, kind of one of the big things I did with this company is f figure out, hey, how do we how do we build new product or new features that are decoupled from the existing system um, enough that decoupled enough that there's definitely some uh, velocity to how quickly we can build new things, but of course still kind of integrated with with um, the back end and things like that. So that for me is, you know, my experience in particular was really with clean architecture is really kind of driven by that experience. How do we move forward quickly? Um, how how do we best increase our velo uh, development velocity? Of course, there are a lot of other other things that that help with that. But kind of moving to you know, if you're on a team that has no conventions where everybody can kind of just do whatever they want. It maybe sounds nice, but it can lead to a lot of friction. Um, there's a lack of learning between developers. Um, so, you know, if you do if you do have conventions set in stone uh, to some degree, for example, hey, we're we're going to build using um, a clean architecture, uh, which we'll go over what that means later. Um, then, yeah, you kind of have more familiarity when you're building new features, and it's you can share your knowledge among your team and there's learning that can happen. So that's basically kind of what my idea was introducing that. And yeah, some there are some good things 
we'll go over the good things or some not so good things. We'll, we'll cover those. Um, and you can kind of see at the bottom of this this uh, picture here some other other things that kind of spawned from that uh, that experience. And we'll cover some of those later on. So yeah, the structure of this talk is we're really going to start off with a higher level overview of architecture, which to me really is asking the question, what, what is important to you? What's important to your team? What's important to your product? Those kinds of questions. Then we'll look at clean architecture um, kind of in detail. And then we'll move on to vertical slices, which for me is a better approach. Um, and we'll get into some of the nitty gritty reasons why I think it is. And then some just kind of an extra extra thing at the end there. So this quote by Martin Fowler, um, not very, maybe doesn't seem very insightful. Architecture boils down to whatever, whatever the important stuff is. Um, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of silly in, in some ways, but I, I like it because it it's true that software architecture, software design is really this broad spectrum of things that you have to, uh, decisions you need to make. And we talk, we talk a lot about trade-offs when we talk about uh, software architecture. And there's just so many different things that it's, again, it really depends uh, the I guess the questions you want to ask really depend on what is important to your organization or to your teams. And so I have a few questions here, um, you know, that we can ask ourselves. I can ask a team or, or you could ask yourself or ask your team. Um, and I think these probably matter to most people, I would think. So do you have confidence in your product? Um, that's to me, that's something you want. You want, you want to be able to trust your product that it's, trustworthy, you know, if you have features that you've built or your team has built, you can trust that they kind of work properly. Um, there's maybe not that many bugs, things like that. And things that kind of directly impact that are, are issues, of, you know, as far as architecture goes, things like can you run unit tests? Um, a lot of legacy code that you might come across, you, there's a lot of systems I've seen that you can't even test the systems. There's such a mess. Um, you literally can't even test them. Um, at least you can. You can't unit test them. And uh, integration tests. Those are important. Also, those can help you have confidence that you've built the right thing or that it at least works according to the uh, requirements or the specifications that you have. And another one is um, is more about isolation between features. If you change feature X. You, you don't want changing feature X to affect or break feature Y. So if you have two totally separate features, and again, this happens when you, you kind of, you're not paying attention to your uh, design and things like that, you might make a change to one feature and it actually breaks a totally other, you know, totally what you thought had no connection to, to that thing that you changed, it'll break something else. So that's pretty common to see in the industry. Again, uh, development speed, which is more about velocity, how, you know, time to market is kind of maybe another way to put that. And things that affect that are how, how clear is it to you as a developer to kind of have a high level overview of the system. And, um, th you know, that includes like code readability, um, being able to find existing features, things like that. Um, and again, a lot of systems are built in a way that it's hard to find existing features or um, it's, it's just really hard to figure out where maybe you need to make a, a particular change to fix a bug, things like that. And uh, I touched on it uh, as far as conventions. Um, are you practicing kind of established uh, development conventions? Are you using tooling that's common in the industry? That one, I guess, is maybe not so, um, I would say I'm not so strongly opinionated on that. Um, I think there's more flexibility there, but but again, it helps to at least have a discussion about those things and, and figure out with your team what matters, what doesn't matter. And 
as far as we, uh, we talk about scalability, and I think that can mean different things to different people or maybe in different contexts, it can mean different things. And what I'm, what I'm thinking about is more about the product itself. Can you scale your product in terms of different ways that you, your users can access the application? That might be APIs, mobile apps, web apps, um, desktop apps, right? There's lots of different ways. So how, how do you build a product or how do you build the, techno like the technology, I guess we could call it the back end? How do you build a system that can kind of plug into all these different clients, whether API or mobile app, et cetera? Um, how do you build those in a way that kind of works without having to duplicate a lot of code and, and those kinds of things? So that's that's important because you don't want to waste your time redoing or duplicating code and, and you know that runs into issues in the future. So this is kind of the high level overview of to me, why software architecture is important, um, because it, it kind of addresses questions as far as how stable your product is, um, your development speed, and how extensible your solutions are. And you can see kind of the business outcomes of each of those. So as, as software developers, we like to focus on the technical aspects, but you know, as far as business people, if you're trying to argue, hey, um, we we need to we need time to refactor our code because it's not extensible enough. Mm -hmm. You know, new markets, being able to tap into new markets, or for, uh, for example, if if you want to build a mobile application, you might need to do that refactoring. So, as far as the biz the actual business outcome goes, um, that's kind of the end goal is to look at these new opportunities or different ways our users can use use the system. All right, so that's done. We'll we'll move on to the actual clean architecture. I guess I guess if anyone has questions, we can kind of shout out, or I'll just keep going. If not, so James, you had you you started a new job. Was was it a big mess? Oh, I'm sorry. What? Oh that... no, James Hickey. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so you started a job, and, and so they, like, like how disorganized was it? Was it? Yeah, so I guess it was very, <clears throat> pretty bad. Um, so the actual, kind of getting into more detail, they, the company had, what you would call a rock star developer, it's kind of this, rogue developer, I guess, of sorts, and he ended up building these products on kind of on his own time for like two years. Um, and it got to the point where the company wanted to build an actual team that would work together. And so th this guy didn't was not interested, I guess, in uh, collaborating and, and actually working on a team. So they, they had to let him go. And so, yeah, it was, it was a lot of like multiple web applications, of course, all of them talking to the same database, but, you know, multiple applications written in different languages, different styles. Um, in this case, there was, there was a custom kind of hand-built front-end framework that was really, really, really coupled to one of, the, one of these web applications. So yeah, it was just, it was really hard to figure out how, how the system even worked to begin with. So, so yeah. the whole team was new though, coming in essentially. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there were some people who had knowledge of the domain itself, kind of the um, like the business domain, but as far as the like actual code and yeah, things like that. This one guy was doing the whole thing. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. Thanks. I have a question relating sure. to this individual. Did this guy had private like a lot of experience to go solo? building the application by himself and did the company give him the resources that he needed to build the application um i'm not sure what his experience was like it like he was technically part of a team but he just he just kind of uh, wasn't interested in in working um uh, i'm not sure why the company you know decided to go two years that way because it's not really an ideal way of, of running a software company, but 
Yeah, I don't really know other than that. I think I had that kind of the same experience myself when I was working with another company and they asked me to build an in-house application, in-house application based on a third party application that they were currently using. Okay. They yeah. Didn't, they didn't give me enough resources. They just assumed that I know a lot and they left me in charge of the entire project. And I had yeah. one year of experience. Okay. Yeah, this guy, this guy, this guy had a lot of experience for sure. But I, the, the problem was that he wasn't willing to work with other developers because um, he was building a product that other people were supposed to contribute to. So, it, yeah, he, he wasn't expected to do it on his own. It's just the way it kind of worked out. So he wasn't a team player. Yeah. Exactly. He wasn't a team player. Yeah. So, yeah, let's uh, let's get into clean architecture. Uh, this this is the diagram that kind of it comes from uh, Uncle Bob or whatever Bob Martin from his website. He he's kind of the I guess the founder or whatever you want to call it of clean architecture. Now I don't know about you. When I look at this, it it's just like <laughs> I know how this works, but every time I look at this, I just kind of um, yeah I don't like it. It it just seems like there's so much going on. Um, it seems really complicated and so to me you know to me when we when I started doing clean architecture that was kind of my first impression was I I kind of know what all these different things are doing after studying this for are they really necessary so um, doesn't look so clean to me <laughs> yeah yeah so some of the properties of of at least what what the intention is with clean architecture is is that you're building a system that's independent of frameworks and and what that means is your your business logic or your domain logic whatever you want to call it 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 doesn't depend on let's say a web framework um, it's decoupled from http it's decoupled from controllers things like that and that leads into a situation where your domain logic is testable since you don't have to rely on like bringing up a whole web server to test your business logic. Um, again, it's independent of UI, independent of database. So it's kind of the same thing. Your your core logic isn't dependent on having to bring up a database, like spin it up and actually run it to, uh, to do tests. And uh, the same thing with the UI. You don't have to bring that up. Um, and this last piece, it basically... For me, just it just means your domain logic is self-isolated. Um, it's not it's not depending on any third services or or anything like that. Now those I mean those are good good principles to have. But I, as as we'll move on, we'll kind of see some issues with how maybe that's implemented. Um, I just want to bring up a quote from the Domain Driven Design book because it, it's kind of what I think all of those principles, what it's really trying to say. And uh, yeah, so from the book, it says, we need to decouple the domain objects from other functions in the system. And um, the, I'm, I won't read the rest, but basically the goal is just so you can have clarity on what your domain is doing. You can separate your domain into the kind of small manageable chunks. And so clean architecture is is really kind of a variant of what we might call ports and adapters. Um, hexo hexagonal architecture is kind of the same thing, or uh, there's other kinds of titles for the same thing. And so basically what, what it is, is you have your domain logic in the center. It doesn't depend on all these other things on the outside, which are usually like infrastructure concerns. So your pers uh, persistence and your HTTP and your caching, um, those kind of point into your domain, but your domain doesn't uh, depend on those. And again, that makes it so you can actually test your domain without, uh, you know, spinning up a database and so on. Um, and this this is uh, very much like uh, a computer, where you have, you know, USB ports and you can kind of plug in USB drives and all these other kinds of adapters and things like that. It's kind of a conceptually, it's kind of a similar similar thing. 
Um, and kind of, yeah, so there are those five principles that we that we went through, but there's kind of this overarching principle, I guess. Um, that to me is 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 very important. And ba basically, again, it just means that all the dependencies point to your domain logic, and your domain logic doesn't depend on other things. Um, and I, yeah, so coming back to this this uh, diagram, it for me, I, f I feel like this diagram just it causes confusion more than anything. And we'll see we'll see that when we get further on to the vertical slices piece of this. Um, that I, I don't think we need all these things, all these different names for things. I think it just kind of confuses. And there's really kind of the you know one or two main principles that I think when you when you apply them, then it kind of covers what you what you're looking for. Um, and again, this is kind of a simplified simplified uh, flow of what that might look like. So you have a web app that depends on some kind of application code and um, your core, which I guess you could call your domain logic, is kind of at the bottom of everything. I'm just going to take a drink here. So what I did is I took three sample uh, repositories off GitHub. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, these are like either templates or just kind of sample sample repos. And so I'm sure you know if if you've heard of clean architecture before, if you've read about it a little bit, the allure of it. Um, or the selling point, I guess, of it is it it helps you to focus on your business more than kind of the technical aspects of your solution. Um, it helps with code readability, and um, one of the big things is if you look at your you know if you look at your file structure, your file system, you can kind of see what your application is doing from a business perspective, and that's. That's kind of the goal to me that um, Bob Martin has kind of explicitly said that. Um, my my problem though is when you look at the actual projects that are implemented with clean architecture, and this this goes for the the way I you know um, what what I had done on this team that I mentioned earlier on the talk. Again, you start making these projects that are all about technical things, right? So your application, your domain project, your infrastructure project. To me, that still doesn't really mean much as far as what what does your business do? Like, what does this application actually do? I can see, you know, some to-do items, a to-do list. Of course, this is a very simple application, but uh, in the domain thing, in the project, you can see a common entities, enums, fence, all these things. But those are all like, technical things. They don't actually tell me what this application does it's from a business perspective. And again, this is a second repository that um, kind of the same thing. You look through this and it's all kind of just technical stuff. Um, domain events, value object, email sender, database populator, things like that. Uh, and then a third one, which very, very similar. Kind of some of the names are changed a little bit, but like now you have core instead of domain. Uh, this is core. Um, but again, this doesn't really. If if I were going into this application, for example, and I needed to fix the you know feature X Y Z, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't know where that is by looking at this this structure. I wouldn't know where where do I begin. I guess I guess I'll go to the web project and I'll open up the pages and I'll hope that the pages are organized well but then i'll have to figure out you know what what are the namespaces in the page to figure out um what i need to change in the core project so um so yeah the good the good parts of clean architecture again your domain logic is separated from io and that means you can test your domain logic it's uh easier to understand th those kinds of things and now we'll get into the bad. <laughs> so the talk is called the good, the bad, the ugly. 
I don't know if I have the ugly piece, but we definitely have some bad stuff here. Um, one, one of the things that I've heard about clean architecture, because it's a ports and adapter like um, uh, architecture, that it's different than the traditional uh, three tier architectural style. Um, and to me, no, it's not really. It's maybe a little bit different, but again, it's it's kind of like you're just naming these different things, right? So way back in the day with web forms, um, they'd call things like web, and then you'd have a business layer, which basically, you know, if you're if you're into .NET, the business layer did nothing, and it just went down to another layer, which is your data layer, and your data layer would call stored procedures, and then your actual business logic was in the database. Um, that's, you know, how a lot of applications were done, like, I don't know, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Um, so we've come around full circle. Now we have the application, the domain project, and repositories. Um, and, and in clean architecture, sometimes they're called application, core, and infrastructure. Uh, to me, it's it's kind of the same thing. Um, I know there are a little, there are some differences um, in terms of how how the dependencies flow. Um, but yeah, I mean that that I guess selling point that I've heard is to me not applicable. Um, we've already covered this. These all these projects are are still focusing on technical concerns. Um, I still don't know what this application actually does from a business perspective by looking at it. And one of the things that that um, the team that I was on. The, one of the big things we ran into was a lot of context switching. So <clears throat> what that means is basically if you are, if you're trying to either build a new feature or you're trying to fix some existing code, um, let's say you need to add a new column to the database and you need to display that that data on the UI. Well, you you have to go through all of these projects. You're going to have to Add some add that property to your infrastructure um, code. You're going to have to add it to like your your database queries. You'll have to add it to maybe your domain logic. Some of your domain objects will need that extra call, that that extra data to do you know business logic or whatever. And then your application layer that's going to you know eventually send that off to the UI is going to need. Maybe you have like a DTO in there, so you're going to have to add another property to that object. So yeah, that there's there's just kind of this overhead to having to go in and change, jump back and forth between all these projects. Um, I yeah, if anyone's been there, you know it's not it's not uh, very productive. And so that that kind of raises the the question why like why do why is there all this context switching, and what what that is a symptom of is your projects have high coupling, they have low cohesion. And so the high coupling piece of that means that there are pieces within those three layers or projects um, that are coupled to each other. Um, in other words, they, they really are wanting to belong together, but you've structured your system in such a way that you've kind of split them, you split the boundaries up in the wrong direction or in the wrong way. So you keep having to jump kind of jump through hoops, so to speak, to uh, to, to fix this or to add new, new code. Um, so yeah, this, this is what um, Bob Martin said about clean architecture. Um, and I guess basically just that last part, the uh, architecture of a software system or a software application should scream about the use cases of the application. And what he's referring to is when I look, when I look at the solution, if I look at the file system and what folders are there, what files are there, I should be able to tell what what this thing is. You know, is it an e-commerce site? Is it a SaaS platform? Is it you know something else? Um, we should be able to kind of see that from the file structure. Um, 
Now that seems kind of strange because basically everything I've just gone over is saying that clean architecture, clean architecture doesn't do this. And so I'm, I'm not sure if it's just the way that people are implementing it or if it's just kind of a, it, it's inherently part of the, the clean architecture style that it's still not going far enough, maybe. Um, and I, you know, there's, I think there's variants on how you can maybe structure your code within each of those different layers. Um, but again, yeah, I mean, this, you know, the GitHub samples that I've looked at and everything I see kind of in popular blog posts and things like that, a lot of them, when they're talking about clean architecture, I don't, I don't see this, 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 um, screaming architecture, so to speak, um, evident. So now, now we'll get into vertical slices, <clears throat> which, you know, for me, when, when I was running into these roadblocks with clean architecture, this, this was kind of the direction I had taken on my own. Um, I didn't, I didn't realize it was called vertical slices at the time. It just kind of seemed the natural, kind of the natural way to fix the, the, the issues like context switching and why, why am I always changing these same files when I'm changing, you know, add or take away from an existing feature? Well, may, maybe I should put all those files together in the same spot. It'll be easier for me to go back and forth between them to see, you know, how, how they interact with each other in terms of dependencies and things like that. So, yeah, one, it's kind of a, diff, a few different uh, topics, I guess, or areas that I'll, I'll talk about as far as uh, vertical slices go. Um, the first one is feature folders. And so we have seen in with some of those samples where like uh, the, the folders were still very technical in nature. So you'd have folders like entities, enums, services, and blah, 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 things like that. So feature folders is kind of the opposite um, where you're saying, I'm going to I'm going to structure my folders in terms of what features my product has. Um, so if it, you know if you have an e-commerce site, you might have a folder that's like the store, you might have a folder that's for your search feature. Um, you might have one that's for like your I don't know, adding products or something like that. Um, and then within each of those features, um, what what I found was applying the uh, CQRS, which we'll go in a little bit later. Um, CQRS basic basically all it means is if you have an, a feature, let's just use the word feature. If you have a feature, then you would just split split the use cases up into either queries, which is hey, I want to fetch data and I want to show it to a user. Um, generally, that's what, what a query is or a command, which is usually initiated by uh, a user. So a user might want to add some information to a system or um, you know, produce some side effect to the system. So then you would, you would um, code that up or you would model that as a command separately from, from a query. And one of, the, one of the nice things about separating features uh, into their own folders and trying trying to keep trying not to share code as much, kind of trying to keep that to a minimum, is um, you can you can kind of isolate each feature on its own. And if you want to kind of do things a little differently for one feature, you can go ahead and do that, and it won't break the other feature if you kind of um, made sure you de decouple them. And so that to me that's a big that's one big selling point. Um, but of course, the, the big one is knowing that I could find existing features, or if I need to add a new feature, I kind of know where where I need to put that. Um, and we'll we'll see some like uh, actual code examples uh, in a little bit. So Jimmy Bogard basically he he just said uh, this is a quote basically saying what I had already mentioned about um, all the context switching. And so the last sentence here, uh, minimize coupling be between slices and it maximizes coupling in a slice. So, so you know changing one feature is 
there's less risk in changing it because it's not going to affect other features and it's quicker to build them. It's easier to, to find bugs, things like that, because all the files you need to change are just kind of in the same spot. So yeah, so CQRS, um, I know a lot of people who talk about CQRS start talking about having like um, databases and things like that. And that that's kind of beyond what, what CQRS really is from, at a fundamental level. And so, yeah, imagine imagine you have a C-sharp class or whatever, Java class, whatever, whatever language you use, um, my user. Um, and in that class, um, you have an ID, you have a first name, last name, display name. Um, and this this is pretty typical of, of most apps where you just have this kind of one massive model. Uh, in this case, we only have four properties, but um, a lot of times they'll have you know classes with like dozens or even hundreds of properties. Um, and some of them are only used when you're writing or so you're, you're issuing uh, commands to your system. And then there are other properties that are only used when you're displaying data to customers. So maybe a lot of times those might be like computed properties or, or things like that. Um, but what we tend to do is kind of just jumble them all up into the same model. And so what you would do with CQRS, you would, you know, as much as you can, try to split those up into two separate models. So um, that might become two different classes, for example. So you'd have one kind of right model on the left-hand side. So every, you know everything in that class, you, you need all of those to perform the right operations. Um, so a lot of times you're kind of your most important business logic or if you call them like restrictions or constraints or invariants, like lots of different names for that. A lot of times those are gonna be when you're writing to, to a system. Um, and then if you need like uh, formatted data or you know things like that, or computed properties, then you just put those in your read model. And so when you're, yeah, so when you're working inside of those classes uh, or within those specific use cases, it's a lot easier to figure out what's going on. It's a lot easier to to kind of reason about it. And for me, I think this is this is probably one of the biggest things. Uh, one of the one of the changes that has made the biggest uh, effect, I would say. So the typical setup <clears throat> would be, for example, if you have like a an API or HTTP. HTTP um, on top of your, your system. You would have the same model. You would use it for get operations. You'd use it for post. Um, you might even use the same model if you're doing like nested, trying to get like a nested object, like an address or user address, um, or even if you're updating it, then you would just use the same user object and say, hey, user, change, change your address. But um, yeah, that, that can kind of, that model can get bloated very quickly and then gets to the point where it's just this God object, it's doing everything and, and yeah, that's not a place you wanna be. So if you, if you split your user up, kind of very similar to what uh, the write and the read model thing that, that I showed, um, then, then this is kind of something you would get doing that. So if you're trying to get the user, so an HTTP get, you might have a, like a specific model for that use case. I'll call it a use case. Um, this might be like show my user profile, I don't, something like that maybe. Um, so you might wanna have like a dedicated model for that. Um, when you're posting, which might be I'm creating a user or I want to update my user or change something. You might have a dedicated model for that, so you know all the logic in that class is only, you know, only for this uh, use case. And same with the address, you might want to split that up into kind of these dedicated models to handle that. You can see that um, the change address class on the bottom there has the city. Maybe for some reason you need the city to to validate that it's um, like a, an actual city. 
but then you don't you actually don't need to show the city on any screens so why why would you include the city in like a your database queries and then b uh, on like any dtos or any objects that you're sending to your client when you don't need it so doing this splitting them up gives you uh, gives it the option to kind of pick and choose uh, what you're going to show or what what you're not going to show or what what you need oops so that that's kind of um inside each of these what i'll call them slices that's what they are it's kind of which call them features call them slices it's kind of the same same term um so you can you can apply cqrs within each of these um slices and you you can kind of do that on a per slice basis which is kind of really nice because you know that uh, slice one or feature one if you change it there's a low risk that you will break another feature and so yeah it's it's really nice where you have this flexibility to kind of do what you want um so yeah here's some code that we'll get into you know i mean it's again it's very like theoretical a lot of me talking um so i'll show some code so hopefully that helps so this is just a, a kind of a very simple uh, mvc project so you can see in the controllers there's a projects controller um, and in the models there's a project model and then in the views you have your of course your project um, and so this this is kind of that same idea of context switching if i if i want to change the pro, my uh, let's say the project model or or i just want to change that feature i might have to go into the controller i might have to go into the model and then i might have to go into the view separately and these are in different folders and and it just kind of becomes a headache having to navigate back and forth between all these different folders and then you need to remember which folder you were in last and right it just becomes confusing so this is just kind of a this is like a dummy just taking that those files and trying to do them in a kind of vertical slice way so as far as like an mvc app goes you might want to create uh, under the areas folder sometimes people like to just rename the areas folder to like features or slices but the idea here is your folder structure is really based on your products features so um, instead of focusing on like controllers and views and those technical things we want to focus on like the business functionality so you have projects and within your projects you you can create a project um, you have an index which you know maybe you want to rename that to like view projects or, or whatever right um, and so you can see within each of those slices with like the create and the index the index one is a little simple you just have a controller you have a view um, that's it the create one maybe is a little more complex because you you have uh, business rules that you need to enforce when you're creating a project so you you have a controller and a view but you also have this extra command then you have a project model which maybe you want to call that a create project model um, again i just kind of like threw these together um, and then at the bottom you might have this project repository I just put that in there to kind of show how you might want to share code. Um, I'm not suggesting this is like the best thing to do, but I know people would ask that question. Hey, well, what if I do need to share something, right? So um, you would kind of just put, I, you know, my 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 way of doing that is just kind of putting it up a level, and then you know that is shared by everything underneath. Um, and then once you start getting to like um, CQRS, you can start creating additional folders where you you might have multiple queries. So imagine on the bottom and in the in the index folder, let's say that was some kind of like uh, dashboard. And so on the dashboard, you have multiple widgets and each widget is like an isolated component. Um, so in here, in your in your queries, you might have like a, you might have separate query classes per widget, for example, um, and then you know that they're all in the same spot. They belong together, but yet they 
these still represent kind of these individual things. Uh, yeah, I guess this is kind of exactly what I was saying. So if you have a dashboard, you just kind of, you can split things up uh, more granularly, granularly um, but all your files are still in the same folder. It's really easy to see how these things uh, work together. So yeah, um, one for me, one of the kind of one of the, I want to say side effects of this is is this idea that you can optimize per slice. Um, I don't think this is like this is the end goal. I think the end goal is is more along the lines of having a, a simpler structure um, that that helps developers find code faster. It helps them to um, build new code fa faster or build new features faster. Um, definitely along the lines of like simplifying things. I think that anytime you can sim anytime you can simplify the structure of an application and yet kind of retain those core principles. Um, like being able to test your code and things like that. I, I think that's a good idea. So yeah, I mean, in this case, we were saying we want to, we are we we're able to optimize queries in terms of their performance, and we can optimize them in terms of their isolation. Um, a lot of times, you know, again, we we like to share code. We might create this like whatever, a repository, it's kind of a typical pattern. And then within your repository, you'll just have these methods, you know, that, that you get users method and things like that. And you're just using those all over the place. So what you can do with slices instead um, is have, again, you can have these queries, for example, um, that are specific to the slice. So you might have a get user profile query in that case, um, it's very specific. You're you're literally going to write your SQL. Um, just just get me the pieces of data I need to show at this screen, and that's it. Uh, on the bottom, you might have maybe like in a situation where you have more sensitive data, and so you create a totally separate model for that feature. Um, and so that way you know that changing changing the slice above isn't going to affect the one below. Um, so you know you get benefits of of security isolation things like that. Hey, hey James, I see that Aldo Garcia has his hand up. Okay. I don't know if he has a question. <laughs> yes, I have one. Uh, it's regarding where you show like the for instance the classes for the queries. Uh, just the question I have is like uh, what is the if there is a scenario that there are like codependent uh, queries or that they can be reused. Yeah, so that, sense? yeah, it does. <clears throat> that, you can do that. Um, in that, I'd say that's more advanced for sure, but you can, you can do things like, um, instead of each of those classes actually like doing the query and fetching your information, they'd be more like query builders. So you would, Maybe you would have like five, five different uh, of these cl these classes to do like individual queries, but then using each of those just generates like a SQL statement, and then you would execute, kind of you'd build them up, kind of like a string builder, right? Um, you'd build all those queries up in kind of one bundle, and then you execute them all at once. Like uh, if you're familiar with Dapper. Um, uh, Stack Overflow, um, they made Dapper, so it's kind of like a micro ORM. And with Dapper, you have the ability to do something like that. You can ish, you can kind of uh, bundle up multiple SQL statements and then execute it kind of in one shot. But then it, you can um, you can assign the results of each of those individual queries separately. But it's still only like one, one connection, one actual query to the database. So yeah, there 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 are other ways to do it. Um, that's a Dapper, not to be confused with the new D A P R Dapper yeah, uh, yeah. portable event driven serverless runtime from Microsoft. That's right. 
Yeah, and there's uh, if you get into domain driven design, there's the specification pattern that you can kind of do something like that. Um, I won't. That's definitely more advanced. I won't really get into it now, but it's something you can look at. Yeah, so there's ways to do that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> so yeah, so in this this case, we're kind of optimizing for performance isolation, and we know like the bottom the bottom slice or the bottom query is dealing with very sensitive information. And because because we're using this uh, dedicated model, it's a dedicated query. Um, we have those benefits of we know that that uh, other features aren't going to bleed into that. And that can cause security issues and things like that. Um, I've, I've seen cases where, yeah, developers have just kind of reused, for example, right, you, the, the classic example of get user. So you have a repository, you get the user. Um, I've seen it happen where developers have done that and they've actually sent passwords or like password hashes to the client, right? Because your, your get user just gets all the columns on your user table, which might have passwords and things like that. So, so yeah, th that's this is a good way to to um, avoid th avoid that, and and it makes you think about what you need, um, as opposed to just kind of hey, I'll just get all all the columns off the user and throw them to the client. Um, <clears throat> and th actually, this kind of addresses the question we just had. Um, as far as like sharing sharing queries, um, like I mentioned, there are kind of these advanced techniques where you can have these query objects that may that re return. It's kind of like a string builder. You're building up these queries, and then once you kind of build them all up, you can execute them all at once. Um, one other thing you can do is is you can you reuse the same queries, but then at your application level, you still have the flexibility to then further um, restrict what information you're sending. And this this might be useful if you have, for example, uh, a web application, but then you also have a mobile API. And let's say your mobile app doesn't show as much information as the website. And um, maybe for, for performance reasons, for like serialization performance gains or for just for uh, network band to save on network bandwidth. You want to have smaller DTOs, or you just want to show less information. Then you can do that at the application there. You can have these dedicated DTOs that then further restrict what your queries are doing. And so you have it's nice because you have the flexibility to kind of do both both of those. You can have dedicated queries that are closer to your database. Um, there's not a lot of mapping going on. And again, these these would be totally decoupled from your right side, from your commands. So um, the commands would would be kind of uh, more to them potentially. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it could it literally could be just as simple as um, it's a SQL statement, and then you're going to fill an object and you're going to send it back. Um, and many times that's as simple as you might need it to be. And the benefit is your query, your queries are decoupled from your your command logic. And like I said, oftentimes your command logic is is where your complexity is going to be. Um, and so this is just kind of like a an, you know theoretical example. Um, let's say we have a command in our system where you are trying to deduct from a bank account, and that that process might have a lot lot of things happening. You might be reading from a cache, and you have external systems that you need to, uh, like maybe APIs, whatever, right? Um, and then you have what we in uh, domain-driven design we'd call an aggregate, which is kind of this this object that's enforcing business constraints. And you can see little triangles around that on the bottom, which represents like other little nested objects that um, that might you know, do some some certain functionalities, and then you have pub sub. Maybe you need to publish events. Um, then you have your database, right? So like, there's a lot going on, and this is very very typical of of um, writing in a system. 
And so the the nice thing is all this complexity can go into this one place. You don't have to reuse these same bloated models for your queries. And, and then you they're kind of you know that whatever whatever is in this command or in these classes is kind of what you need. It's nothing more, it's nothing less. And so that that's definitely a big benefit um, to splitting these up. <clears throat> so again, we'll just kind of go over the, the benefits of, of slices uh, quickly. There's a lot less context switching if you do this uh, right. The architecture is generally speaking much simpler. And for me, that's just, it's, if you can, again, if you can simplify the, the structure of your applications and they're still testable and they're still maintainable and, and oftentimes I think they're more maintainable, um, then that's just, why, why would you, why would you do something else in my opinion? Um, you can still decouple your domain logic from your infrastructure. Instead of having different projects, you just, just use interfaces, right? So um, take like a repository, that's kind of the classical example. Um, if you have a repository that you need to fetch information from, uh, if it's an interface, then you, you can stub that out or you can mock it in your tests, things like that. And um, definitely a big thing is, is the, there's a lot less risk between slices and for me for me this is one of the biggest benefits um i think anytime you can do something that reduces the risk in your software systems um that, that's just such a big thing um i've i've worked i've worked on systems that just you change something you have no idea what else is going to change and it's just so hard to work in those systems um so yeah this, this is a big one and of course this kind of touches on security a little bit too um it's easier to find code of course um and optimizations per slice again it's it's um it's really nice where you might want to take a diff like a totally different approach to doing one even like one query that's going to be really complex maybe it's like a report or something um, then you just you make that one query as complex as it needs to be, and every maybe every everything else within that feature um, is like really basic, right? So um, it's nice to be able to kind of split those up that way. So cons, um, if there are any, and it, I don't know, I don't know if this is a con or not, but it it, it puts you in a situation where you need to actually the features you're building instead of again just grabbing that repository and get user and then just throw that at the client um, you need to actually think about what you're doing um, if you want to build testable code then you need to think about well um, do i need to put an interface here or not and things like that um, and it is it is kind of a paradigm shift in a sense where it's quite different than what i think most of the industry is used to doing um but you know it's it's just one of those things with with uh, practice and, and those practice and experience um it just becomes easier and i i think that the uh the benefits come back very quickly uh, it doesn't take long to to see the benefits when you're actually doing this in a real system so i have one last slide um, I, I just want to mention this because I know I know a lot of people talk about vertical slices and clean architecture and, and all these things, but the, these are still, I guess, what you could call architectural patterns, and so they're still kind of a lower level thing than what some people call architectural patterns, I guess. Um, so in domain-driven design, there's this idea or this concept called bounded context. And basically, what, what you do is you, you look at your domain, you look at your business, and you, you try to put boundaries around um, different areas. And um, they, they may be different departments, they may be different products, uh, it depends on your business, but 
what you're doing is you're kind of encapsulating these different domains, so to speak. Um, you can kind of, you know, one way to think about it is they're kind of like subsystems, but uh, it's definitely in the logical sense because um, we're not ta we're not talking about like each of these is a separate API, each of these is a what a separate system. They could be they could be what people call microservices. That's a loaded term, but um, it could be microservices, or they could just be different .NET projects. Um, they even if you wanted, they could just be different folders in a in a project. Um, I probably wouldn't do that, but um, definitely different projects would make sense. And so what? This is more of like a strategic thing. Um, that maybe uh, like junior developers probably wouldn't be getting into this so much, but definitely if you're a senior developer, you might have to get into some of these things like, um, you know, how, how are different products in a system going to interact with each other? Are they going to share the same data, database tables or are you going to keep them separate? Um, are they each, is, are each of these products going to have their own um, dedicated tables or even dedicated database? And then they'll just interact with each other through other means, like API calls or um, sending um, like asynchronous events or mess using messaging uh, to do that. So, um, yeah, the point here is each of these bounded contexts have will have different levels of complexity. So on the in the middle there, you have account management, and maybe in this system, account management is really simple. Like it, it's just CRUD. You're just creating an account, you're updating an account, you're deleting an account. Um, it's, it's nothing more than that. It's just, you're just kind of storing data, you're displaying data. There's the business rules in there are not that complicated. Why why would you go and use, for example, clean architecture that in my opinion is kind of complicated. It can be complex. Um, uh, to me, that wouldn't make sense. Um, so just, you know, Build something simple. On the left-hand side, you might have something with like medium complexity. So you might want to do something where you're doing this uh, slices or you're doing something with uh, CQRS. So you have commands and you have queries, these different classes to handle different concerns. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you might have even something that's even like way more um, complex, but like scheduling. So you you know you're looking at schedules for a user, or you're generating reports, you're booking appointments. Um, so in that case, you might you might want to go with um, more of these heavyweight domain-driven design concepts, I guess, if you want to call them that. Um, but, you know, why would you do that in the case of the, the account management when the complexity is really low? So that's just something I want to throw out. You know, it's vertical slices is great. Um, you know, I tend to use that kind of style when I'm just doing any new projects. Um, you know, but there's kind of a higher level discussion or a high, higher level question as far as, well, when should you use vertical slices or when should you use clean architecture? Um, now personally, I, I would rather use slices over clean architecture. Um, but again, you might have systems that are just doing really basic CRUD. Um, so why why would you make it more complex than it needs to be? So that's that's something to think about. Um, you know, I think it's applicable to this topic for sure. Um, and I think it's actually more important than the slices versus clean architecture discussion. Um, I think this thinking about your systems in this way is more important. But I guess that would be a whole other talk um, than this one. So yeah, that is the end. So I guess if anyone has questions, go ahead. That's great. So as a, I've not actually looked at the CQRS pattern so much. So that's something new for me in that I haven't looked at it. Um, and the slices are interesting. I like that. And the bound of context really taking the business problem. And, and these are the areas that you have to look at. Yeah. So, you know, some of this stuff is natural, <laughs> you know. Any questions, anybody?
So what what city in uh, very much northern uh, Canada did, did you come from? I, I mean, I know the West Coast a little bit more. I know Vancouver Island, Vancouver, Prince Rupert up, up north into Alaska some, but I don't know the East yeah. Coast much. Yeah, I'm originally from northern New Brunswick. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I guess, close to like Newfoundland. Yeah. I don't know how, how far north it is compared to like Vancouver. I think it's, it is farther north than Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver's, you know, just above the 50th parallel here, so. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, uh, it's. Prince Rupert's up there a ways. That's a few hours north by plane, so. Okay. It's probably similar. I think the West Coast. Yeah, it depends on where you are because of like the prairies and stuff. I think the prairies are generally more cold sure. than some of the East Coast places. Yeah. I guess protection from the trees and things like that. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I guess there's no question. Let's see. We... I do have a quick one. Go ahead. Um, I guess it's more anecdotal, but after you implemented a new cleaner architectural pattern, what was your experience with working on the software project before and after? And were there any interesting stories or a personal impact on the team or what what would you say about that yeah definitely definitely made a big impact the probably the biggest thing is the context switching um so like we had we had gone with kind of the typical clean architecture structure and then got to the point where it was like well why do we keep having to jump back and forth between these different projects so we pretty much just took like all the, you know, all the data layer, if you want to call it that, mm-hmm. all the in- infrastructure uh, classes, and then just kind of one by one put them into the the uh, domain project or whatever you want to call it. Um, just put them kind of in the folders that they applied to, and it was like that. That's all you needed to do, right? So we were already kind of abstracting those away using interfaces so we could test our domain logic. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed like why, like after doing that, and then you can look at your file structure and see your, you know, in this case, maybe it's like a, it's it's not the best example. It's just, it's what comes to mind. Or maybe product, right? So you have your product class, um, and then you might have like a command to, change a product or whatever to order a product and then you have right next to it you have the actual like repository or the query or whatever you're you're using but nothing changes so it's like now we don't have to do all that context switching what what was what was the point of having that extra project that sure you know, um so yeah i mean it's kind of like it's funny how that happens right you just kind of i guess you explore the typical way of doing things and you figure out what works and what doesn't and did um, you um uncover any costs to that approach uh, i mean obviously i totally understand not having to switch context and bounce between your controllers and your business domain and your data access layer yeah. any like side effects or costs that maybe you didn't you like kind of had to get used to or yes or no probably the yeah probably the biggest thing is in it's very similar to the question uh, someone else had with uh, as far as like sharing queries. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of one of the things that can kind of happen is you end up writing like individual queries for all these different things, and then by you know by the time you're done, you're you're issuing like ten different database calls to do this one thing. Right. Um, and I think that's more about like develop the developer recognizing you know how more so like optimizing the query for that use case okay I think it, it's kind of easy to generalize everything right so hey i'm gonna i'm gonna do this database call but i'm gonna generalize it because someone else might need to use this piece of code for another <laughs> feature or somewhere <laughs> else tomorrow so i'll just include every <laughs> property on the model yeah yeah like, yeah exactly so Instead of that, I, you know, I would have, yeah, I would have maybe if I need to do like five different queries, then I would just kind of bundle that into like one logical query, so to speak. So it'd be like one class, but then that one class is maybe, you know, issuing multiple queries to the database, but then it's just returning like the one object. 
Um, and then that way you can you can do that efficiently. You can do like five database calls, but uh, like I mentioned with Dapper, there there are ways you can do that efficiently. You can, if you have like five different database queries, you can do them all asynchronously. So they're all running concurrently at the same time and then join them together. Um, but then the, the use case itself, which is call one method, like get me the data for this query. Um, and then it doesn't need to know that it's actually doing like a bunch of different queries under the covers. And that makes it easier to unit test because from your test perspective, you just need to mock the one interface. And as opposed to like mocking like five different interfaces because <laughs> there's five different so-called queries that are happening. Um, and there are other other things like I've seen developers like in terms of use cases. So if you, you take like commands or queries, actually um, like reusing queries inside of other queries. So using like de like uh, dependency injection. So you would take one query that you've made and put it into the constructor of another query that you've made. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that's like that's totally not getting the pick like the point that um like each class is doing the one like business operation it's not a technical thing right it's not like the database query it's the the users doing this specific thing um and that yeah that can make things a little hard for testing uh, just that you end up getting like really weird dependency graphs that way right so it becomes confusing but sure. As far yeah. as, I guess one last thing, um, as far as unit testing, <laughs> the previous developer do much of it or was there a big success story after the, the new architecture and building a lot of unit tests or integration tests? Yeah, one of the things I like is um, with with the queries, <clears throat> it, it's nice because you generally like you, you don't really need to test your queries that like they're not as important, I guess, as the commands. Sure. Um, like if I'm showing some information on a dashboard, I mean, you, I mean, you want to you want to make sure you're not showing like passwords on it or whatever, right? But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, That's but definitely I get ignore. Yeah, but your um, yeah your commands. That's definitely where like the the stuff you want to test usually. That, that's where it is. Um, so for me, I like there's two different ways I like to test. One one is inside the command. I'll have an aggregate, if you want to call it that. Um, so I'll have like a C sharp object that has like no dependencies on like uh, interfaces or like other things. It just it takes in like data or classes that I've made that um, yeah it doesn't depend on like a database call or anything like that. So then I can test that like all my business logic is in that object. I can test all my different scenarios with it. Um, and then the use case, which like, it would be the command, the command kind of orchestrates the, the uh, passing the data around. So the use case would get a, repo a query or a repository, fetch some data, and then put that data into the aggregate and say, OK, uh, update the user or create a transaction to the bank account. And then at the end, you would store the results or whatever. So with with the use case, I would that's more of where I would do like smoke tests because it's more testing that integration or that orchestration aspect. Um, cool. But then you have to mock, right? So that's kind of the cost of, of that. So I'd, that's why I would do more of like the smoke test because you have to mock. It's It becomes a little verbose sometimes. And then it, the actual domain object that's not relying on interfaces you can those are really easy to test so then i would do uh, more granular like unit tests on those very cool all right anything else anybody thank you for an awesome presentation i really yeah. appreciate it thank you yeah, okay, i'm that, gonna that's i'm that's gonna it. stop the recording and uh we'll be post i'll send you a link